Thank you. Good afternoon. So as Kelly said, I'm Kevin Pants. I'm the director of the Center for Constitutional Liberty at Benedictine College. And the mission of the Center for Constitutional Liberty is to inspire a new generation with America's founding principles, and also to show how those principles intersect with Catholic political thought. A few years ago, our college adopted a strategic plan of transforming culture in America uh, through our mission of community, faith, and scholarship. And the college is centers of distinction, such as the Center for Constitutional Liberty, but also things like the Center for Beauty and Culture or the Center for Family Life, all help pursue that mission on campus and also through extension programs. And that's why I'm excited to be here with you today and why I'm excited to be part of this mission at Benedictine College. The title of my talk is, Is American Democracy Worth Saving? And uh, my answer is going to be yes. Uh, the problem that I'm going to start with... Okay. The problem I'm going to start with is this uh, question that I think, it's always been with American Catholics, but has been with us, I think, in an especially um, present way over the last decade or so. A lot of attention has been given to a particular critique given by some Catholics that America is built on the moral relativism of John Locke, and therefore that many of the problems that we face in our country today are with us on account of our founding principles rather than in spite of them. So the question I'm going to address is whether this critique is correct or not. I'm going to divide the talk into three parts. The first part, and the longest part, is going to be on the American founding and its Catholic influences, especially the thought of St. Robert Bellarmine. The second part is going to be a brief look at how American Catholics in history have understood the principles of the founding. And then the shortest and final part is going to be looking at what the modern popes have said, how they've interpreted our founding principles. Okay, so one thing I think that the critique gets uh, right, or that there's at least some truth to their critique, is the idea that John Locke was, at the end of the day, a kind of relativist. However, America, I argue, was not exclusively built on Lockean political principles, on Lockean political theory. And moreover, I argue that the things that our founders took from John Locke aren't the relativism or some kind of hedonistic will to power, but are things like the importance of natural rights, that we have rights that come from God and not from government, uh, that were equal in some fundamental politically relevant respect, that some kind of consent is essential for good political rule by the people, a rejection of the divine right of kings theory in favor of the right of the people to change their form of government. And those principles, I argue, aren't just compatible with Catholicism, but they're actually uh, rooted deeply in Catholic political thought. So those principles, the fact that we have natural rights, that government's based on consent, a rejection of the divine right of king's theory, these are all discussed in John Locke's second treatise of government. Locke's first treatise of government, which laid the groundwork for the second treatise, was an extended attack on the divine right of kings. And this is the idea that people should have no say in their government, that political rule should be by kings on a hereditary principle, and they have a right to rule from Adam, who was created by God, through hereditary succession down to the present day. Uh, John Locke hoped to replace this theory with what he puts forward in the second treatise, but while the divine right of kings theory might sound vaguely Catholic because it sounds kind of medieval or something, um, it's actually a relatively modern theory that grew out of the Protestant world, uh, in the turmoil after the Reformation to justify the state's domination over the church. And John Locke wrote his first treatise, the one that directed against the divine right of kings theory. It was against a man named Sir Robert Filmer, who authored a book called Patriarcha. And that book was the clearest expression of this divine right of kings theory. Um, Filmer had written the book, Patriarcha, to justify the absolutist rule of King James I as opposed to some of the popular sympathies that were still somewhat in line with the Catholic religion. Filmer, the proponent of divine right of kings theory, directed most of his argument against Catholics and also some Calvinists. And these were the groups, from Filmer's point of view, who most uh, directly opposed the divine right of kings theory. 
the book Patriarcha. It starts with an attack on the very first page. The very first page of Patriarcha is an attack on the thought of Robert Bellarmine. And Robert Bellarmine was a Jesuit cardinal of the 16th and 17th centuries. And in the passages that Filmer cites and attacks, Bellarmine defends the role of the people in determining the form of government. And he also defends a principle of human equality in political life. Filmer, the Divine Right of Kings guy, forthrightly opposed both of those notions from Robert Bellarmine. Okay, so according to the idea that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, uh, Bellarmine and John Locke are sort of like friends when it comes to those principles that the American founders took from John Locke, even if they disagreed in other respects. So who exactly was Robert Bellarmine? Uh, Bellarmine was an Italian Jesuit and a scholar. He was canonized in 1930, and he was named a doctor of the church the following year, 31, by Pope Pius XI, in the midst of a bunch of turmoil in Europe, in the midst of the growth of authoritarian uh, regimes that were anti-Christian. Uh, so Robert Bellman published a collection of his uh, thought in a work called The Controversies in the 1590s. And this was done while he was teaching in Rome. Uh, many of these controversies are on apologetic and theological topics, probably many of the same topics that are will be covered uh, in other points this weekend. But some of the controversies that Bellarmine dealt with were political. Uh, they were about the best regime, the origins of government, and also the government of the church. So I'm going to briefly discuss five aspects of Bellarmine's political thought that I think are especially relevant to the American founding. Um, the first is that we're political by nature. So this means we require other people, we require political communities in order to develop our capacities, our natural capacities, and in order to be happy. We're not radically autonomous and isolated individuals. That was really important for Robert Bellarmine. Um, second, he thinks it's extremely important to show that there's a role for consent of the multitude or the many or the people in the form of government in every state. Um, he argues that God has established two powers or two authorities. One focuses on earthly matters. So this is the temporal power. The other focuses on spiritual matters, the church. And when it comes to the church, the spiritual power, the spiritual authority, he's, God has actually established a particular form of government that we see in the Catholic hierarchy today. But when it comes to political authority and temporal rulers, God has done nothing similar. He has not directly instituted the presidency of the United States as he has the papacy. So Bellman reasoned that this meant that God must have left the determination of the particular regime, the particular political community, to the multitude in a regime. Uh, they don't get to choose whether or not they have a political community. They don't get to choose whether or not they have a government. Reason dictates that we need political community in order to flourish and to be happy. So you don't get to choose that. But we do get to choose what kind of government we have. So the multitude could establish a, a democracy, if they so choose. They could establish an aristocracy, a rule of the few. They could establish a monarchy. They could establish, establish a mixed regime where different elements of the three are combined. So uh, God didn't give um, political authority directly to any particular man. And so that means that no one has a direct right to rule another by nature. So it's for the people to decide who should rule and what form of government they should have. Okay, the third aspect of Bellarmine's political thought that I think is important in thinking about the American founding is that Bellarmine shows us, uh, I think, an a, uh, accurate understanding of what equality really means. It, equality is one of the principles that Filmer, the Divine Right of Kings guy, thought that Bellarmine got very wrong. So Bellarmine argued that we're not equal in wisdom, we're not equal in grace, we're not equal in wealth, we're not equal in, in virtue, but we are equal in sharing a common human essence or substance. So in political life, we're equal in a politically relevant way. Uh, no one has a direct right to rule from God over us. So equality is important for Bellarmine. Fourth, Bellarmine thinks that it's essential the government not be a tyranny. So the people have to establish a government. They're not free to choose whether or not to have a government. They also are not totally free to establish just whatever government they might want. Uh, you can't reasonably establish a tyranny. And tyrannies are classically defined as 
uh, rule for the perceived particular advantage of the ruler rather than for the common good. So whatever government the people establish has to be in line with the natural law. And the natural law is the unwritten law that's put on our hearts by God that applies to all people and at all times. It's the law that directs us to be good and avoid evil. The law that tells us that adultery is wrong, even if the written law of our particular political regime happens to tolerate it. Um, one might object that you, know, you look around and people disagree about what the natural law requires. I would argue this is not evidence that the natural law is false, just that when you get into the secondary or tertiary precepts of natural law, things become a little bit more complex. So disagreement is not, I think, good evidence that the natural law doesn't exist. An important aspect of politics in the Christian and classical notion of political thought is that political rulers, even in democracies, must respect this natural law, which is, again, for our good, for our happiness, for our flourishing. Otherwise, if we don't do that, we'll have tyrannical mob rule. Okay, and then finally, when it comes to the particular regimes that the people might want to establish, Bellarmine argues that maybe the monarchical form of government is, in theory, superior. He reasons that maybe that's why God gave something like a monarchical form of government to the church in the form of the papacy. However, Bellarmine thought that in political regimes, uh, they, maybe something less than the ideal was more fitting for most people at most times. And this would be a regime that makes the best elements of each of the other kinds of regimes for some stability. So it could be uh, a mixture of monarchy, rule of one, with aristocracy, rule of the few, with democracy, rule of the many. Bellarmine thought that the selection of the ruler could be by hereditary succession. Nothing excludes that exactly, but he thought it would be preferable not to have uh, not to have political rule based on hereditary succession. It would be better, he thought, to have the ruler drawn from the whole body of the people. Uh, so that's a democratic form of government if you're drawing from the whole group of the people. And then I'd argue that here in America, we actually have something kind of like this mixed regime. We have a strong, energetic executive power that was designed by the framers of the Constitution uh, to be, in some ways, maybe even more powerful than the British monarch. Uh, our founders also were quite skeptical of pure democracy and mob rule. In the Federalist Papers, democracy is a pejorative. So I think they also share that in common with Bellamy. Okay, so what does this 16th, 17th century Jesuit have to actually do with the American founding? Is there actually a link between Bellamy and the founders? I think there's a couple little things that could be said for a possible direct link. So go ahead and say them. Uh, one is that we know that Thomas Jefferson had a copy of Filmer's Patriarcha in his library and that he donated to the Library of Congress. So this is the book that on the very first page condemns Bellarmine as the proponent of rule by consent and a certain kind of equality against the divine right of King's theory. We know that George Wythe, who was a professor at William & Mary, we, there's contemporaneous evidence to suggest that he also had a copy of Patriarcha, most likely in the college library there where many of our founders would have studied. And you wouldn't have to be a careful reader of Patriarcha. Uh, you wouldn't have to be engaged in a close seminar discussion of Patriarcha in order to encounter the main political principles of Robert Bellarmine. You just have to open it up to the very first page. And the whole book is framed around a critique of these two Bellarminian principles. Okay, so the, that's one thing. And then there's also a little piece of evidence that Bellarmine, Bellarmine's thought might have directly been known to the founders in some way. And that is that when Thomas Jefferson later on was establishing the University of Virginia Library, he wrote to his friend James Madison and asked him for advice about what books to include in the theological section of the library. Uh, maybe uh, Madison had been at Princeton, so maybe that was kind of reputed to be a more religious sort of place, and so maybe Jefferson thought that Madison would have some special insights on that question. Uh, Madison sends back a list. It's not super long. It's a couple dozen texts, but one of them is... Bellarmine himself is this book of controversies that even if Madison hadn't read it, he at least knew enough to know that this was one of the most influential books that students at the University of Virginia should encounter in the library. So we know they at least were familiar with the text or knew about it. Okay, but let's say there is no good direct link between Bellarmine's thought and the founders. I think there's also a very important indirect link, maybe a more important indirect link, especially for us today. And that is that if John Locke's arguments rely on moral relativism and skepticism about the human capacity to know moral truths, 
The founders were actually themselves much closer to Bellarmine's political thought. They were much closer to Bellarmine's justifications for equality because Bellarmine believed in a shared human essence just as many of the founders like, for example, James Wilson clearly did. Uh, they believed in a consent of the governed that was much closer to Bellarmine's ideas than to Locke's. So are our political institutions in America justifiable according to the political wisdom of our great Catholic thinkers? I argue that not only can a certain understanding of equality and consent be justified, as Bellarmine shows us, but also that the goodness and longevity of our institutions uh, depends upon the extent to which Catholics and other Christians and citizens of goodwill, with an appreciation of natural law, are able to exert influence on these institutions and offer the nation a spirited defense. Okay, and then the last two parts of my talk are much shorter. But the second part, I just want to touch briefly upon, okay, how have American Catholics thought about the relationship of American political principles to Catholic truth over the centuries? Uh, this last decade is certainly not the first time that American Catholics have wrestled with the extent to which the nation that they live in can be supported by loyal Catholic citizens. Back in 1893, the American bishops gathered in Baltimore for a plenary council, and they discussed the relationship between Catholicism and America. The bishops were fully aware of the dangers of some of the purportedly relativistic philosophic influences on the American founding, but nevertheless, the bishops didn't think that the American founding could be simply reduced to those influences. So through Christianity, through the old principles of Christian political thought, the tradition of natural law was still very much alive at the time of the American founding. The American government is based, the framers built the government on the idea that there is in fact an objective moral order and the governments are bound to comply with the moral law. Here's what the bishop said. We consider the establishment of our nation's independence, the shaping of its liberties and laws as a work of special providence. It's framers building better than they knew, the Almighty's hand guiding them. And if ever the glorious fabric is subverted or impaired, it will be by men forgetful of the sacrifices of the heroes that reared it, the virtues that cemented it, and the principles upon which it rests. Okay, so they called it a glorious fabric, a work of special providence. I don't know, that sounds like something that maybe American Catholics can work with. You know, we don't have to throw the whole thing out if, it, if these things are true. Okay, if we fast forward to the mid 20th century, an important Jesuit scholar named John Courtney Murray, whom, whom I'm sure many of you are familiar with, was also preoccupied with concerns about America and Catholicism, at least earlier on. Murray was the church's most important public intellectual in America, and uh, he even made the cover of Time magazine. And if you look closely uh, behind him, you'll see Bellarmine's text there, that the editors, apparently the editors of Time magazine thought that Bellarmine's text was relevant to America in some way. Uh, he also ended up playing an important role at the Second Vatican Council, at least in its first couple of years. And Murray argued that there was an American consensus about the nation's founding principles. So you have the principles, and then you have an American consensus about what the principles are. And he argued that that American consensus is fully compatible with Catholic doctrine, but that that consensus of the American principles that are compatible with Catholic doctrine is endangered. Uh, they had to be zealously preserved. So I'm going to briefly discuss four of them. Uh, one part of this consensus that was important to preserve about our nation's founding principles is that we're one nation under God. So endowed by our creator in the Declaration of Independence, um, Washington and Adams, our first two presidents in the earliest days of the Republic, famously and somewhat controversially decreed days of fasting and thanksgiving. They argued that individuals owed things to God. We owed gratitude to God. And moreover, they argued that not just individuals, but also human societies had a moral duty to render worship to God in the form of collective days of thanksgiving. Um, so I think that's an important part of our heritage that Murray thought was important to preserve. Okay, second, the idea of natural law. So... The natural law is very important to our founding principles. If we look at the way that they were used, especially in the 19th century, with our nation's biggest controversy over slavery, the principles of the Declaration of Independence didn't mean that the people could simply decide, yes or no, whether slavery was good or bad. It meant that 
The people had to shape their laws in accordance with the natural law. And not because God is imposing it upon us to be mean, but because it leads to our flourishing into a happy society. So that was Lincoln in the 1860s, but what about the framers themselves? Did they think that individual autonomy, that individual rights, meant that there was a right to do something wrong? If we take Alexander Hamilton, who's over there, uh, I think the answer has to be no, they did not think there was such a right. So Thomas Hobbes has a state of nature theory, kind of like Locke's, except that Thomas Hobbes thinks that in the state of nature, there is no natural law except for self-preservation. Every other kind of law is merely a convention of the political sovereign. Uh, Even if John Locke ends up being kind of similar to Hobbes, Hamilton shows that this is not the way that the framers themselves understood things. Hamilton was insistent that Hobbes was wrong about this and insisted explicitly that human beings are governed by God with a natural law that applies to all people and at all times. They did not intend to establish a government to free people from the constraints of law and turn them toward moral relativism. They accepted natural law. And if they didn't, then Hamilton suggests they wouldn't have done what they did. Uh, you know, they were, he insists they were not doing what Hobbes was doing. Okay, third, the principle of consent is an important part of the American consensus, but it's consent rightly understood. So one could say that we should have political consent of the multitude because we all have different preferences and need to uh, see what subjective value judgments should be imposed upon others by looking at a majority's subjective preferences. You might be skeptical that human deliberation or reason can lead to actual moral truths or to reasonable actions in political life. But for Bellarmine and for John Courtney Murray, they were insistent that this principle of consent was based on the multitude's capacity for moral reasoning and even live a reasoning to a certain degree about the objects of government, at least in the big picture. So uh, they're not skeptical about the ability of the human mind to access truth or to deliberate and come to some kind of reasonable conclusion about what the common good might require. It's not just a system of clashing wills. It's a consent based on optimism about the human mind's capacity to know the truth. So that's the third important aspect of Murray's consensus about America's founding principles. And then finally, it was important for Murray that America maintained a virtuous people. And he thinks this is an essential part of the thought of the American founding. So even though our institutions were built strongly, uh, they were built to withstand the possibility that there won't always be a great statesman who's enlightened at the helm. They didn't merely depend upon always channeling private vices toward a public good. At the end of the day, Over the long run, they're still needed to maintain a virtuous population in order to maintain the free institutions. So our free institutions require a virtuous people, as so many of our founders made clear. And uh, the very last one is probably the most striking quote from John Adams. Our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It's wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Okay, so if we're not a moral and religious people, I think Adams' suggestion is uh, this Republican form of government is totally unsuitable. A corrupt and debased population requires probably something much more authoritarian, as I imagine what Adams had in mind. So in order to preserve our Republican form of government, we have to have a virtuous population. And when it comes to virtue, Washington also thought that virtue wasn't simply about um, defending the republic or something like that. Washington says that virtue is uh, intrinsically tied to human happiness, which is a perfect encapsulation of the classical tradition. All right, so that's sort of how Americans have looked at things. American Catholics have interpreted these principles over the years. Uh, Murray's American Consensus, again, these four (coughs) principles that he thinks kind of summarizes the parts of the American founding that are consonant with Catholic political thought. One nation under God, the natural law applies, consent must be rightly understood, and that the people have to be virtuous. All right, so what about the successors of Peter? How have they interpreted America's founding principles? On John Paul II's first visit to America as Pope, he visited Philadelphia, and he commented on the Liberty Bell and on our Declaration of Independence. He really liked that the Liberty Bell was inscribed with a Bible verse from Leviticus about proclaiming liberty throughout all the land. 
And by the way, that verse is on the cover of these booklets that were on your seats. And uh, these are yours to keep. They also include a selection of papal addresses about America's founding principles that uh, I'll be talking about some of them just now. But in case you're interested in reading more, you can read it straight from the Pope's. So about the Declaration, John Paul II says that it's a remarkable document containing a solemn attestation of the equality of all human beings endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, expressing a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. These are the sound moral principles formulated by your founding fathers and enshrined forever in your history. In the human and civil values that are contained in the spirit of this declaration, there are easily recognized strong connections with basic religious and Christian values. All right, um, sound moral principles. Easily recognize strong connections with Christian moral values. And that sounds like something that we can work with here. Pope Benedict has said something similar about our founding principles. When he visited the White House in 2008, standing alongside President Bush, uh, he says that America, that our quest for freedom from the beginning, from our founding, has been guided by their conviction that the principles governing political and social life are intimately linked to the moral law and to God the creator. So he links that all the way back to the American founding. And most recently, Pope Francis, when he visited Philadelphia, when he came to Philadelphia for the World Meeting of Families, I think it was in 2015 or so, and gave that famous address to the joint session of Congress. He referred quite favorably to our Declaration of Independence. He even suggested that it's intrinsically linked to the principle of human dignity. So I'm tempted to say that if America's founding principles, rightly understood, are good enough for our three most recent popes, those principles should probably be good enough for us American Catholics who actually live here. This did not mean that the popes thought American freedom was totally safe when stripped of the natural law and its reliance on God. Uh, instead, it had to be understood in light of the truth. We have to have freedom understood properly, not as an end in itself, but as a means to the to our self-giving and service. St. John Paul II in Evangelium Vitae warned us that freedom negates and destroys itself and leads to the destruction of others when it no longer recognizes and respects the truth. At that point, everything is negotiable, everything is open to bargaining, even the first of the fundamental rights, the right to life. The democratic ideal, which is only truly such when it acknowledges and safeguards the dignity of every human person, is betrayed in its very foundations. This is what is happening. It goes on more, much more ominously. This is what is happening in politics and government. In this way, democracy moves toward totalitarianism. The state is transformed into a tyrant state, which arrogates to itself the right to dispose of the weakest and most defenseless members. Okay, so in order for democracy not to lead to democratic tyranny, as John Paul II warned us, the rule of the majority has to be grounded in the truth of natural law. And American institutions were, I argue, built on principles of Catholic political thought, whether or not the frame framers were explicitly conscious of doing so. And to transform culture in America today in order to preserve those institutions that were built by the framers, I think it's essential for Catholic citizens, other Christians, and other citizens of goodwill to insist on the role of natural law and virtue in our common political life, the role of the truth. Otherwise, America will certainly become the political embodiment of that hedonism and relativism that her critics have long suspected her to be. And this conversation about the relationship between America and Catholicism is why I'm so excited to be part of Benedictine College's mission to transform culture in America. And I wanted to just point to you, if you want to bring any of these extra handouts home, there's more over there, I believe, possibly. And also, we're excited to welcome Ross Douthat to our campus on February 16th, next Thursday, is giving a talk on Christians in political life. If any of you wants to make the trip out to Kansas City, in Atchison, Kansas, we'd love to have you. And there's invitations back there. And also, we have a table upstairs. So I hope you stop by our booth. And I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you.